Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, today uh, I pulled out a collection of some of my patterns that I have either made over the years. Some of these are some patterns that I actually uh, are just some old patterns that I have in a collection of stuff that I've got. But I wanted to spend some time talking to you about the art of pattern making that is used for making patterns for foundry work. So if you're casting something out of cast iron, out of aluminum, brass, bronze, whatever, uh, you needed a pattern to actually put into a mold to make whatever you want to make. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is that because of some of my videos that I've done, I've done a fair amount of pattern making and having castings done over the years. And a lot of people out there are doing this now themselves. And uh, through uh, foundries such as Windy Hill Foundry and Cattail Foundry and some of these other smaller foundries that will do small work for for um, individual people, uh, they're getting more and more uh, requests to do this kind of stuff. And I, I know I was talking with my friend Clark Easterling, who uh, is the owner at Windy Hill Foundry, who is the main foundry that I'm using now. And he told me that he's been having a lot of trouble lately getting patterns from people that really don't understand what you need to do to make a good pattern. And it's basically taking him hours and hours and hours to get a good mold because the patterns just aren't right. In many cases, he's having to go back and rework the patterns just to make them usable. That really is cutting into his time. It's making the, the projects a lot more expensive than they should be. Uh, and just doing a few little tricks right up front can eliminate a lot of that. So I'm going to show you some of the patterns that I've got here. I'm going to talk to you about some of the principles in pattern making, just some of the basics that you need to understand. Uh, and I think that once you kind of wrap your mind around what you need for a good pattern, it's uh, going to make your job of making a pattern a lot easier. Let's get in here and look at some patterns. I'm going to start off with what I'm just going to call a simple pattern. I'll call it a simple pattern because it's basically a one piece pattern. This is not a split pattern. There's no cores. It really is uh, probably the easiest types of patterns uh, that you would make. And these are some examples of some simple patterns that I have done over the years. So um, first off, what kind of material should my pattern be made out of? It needs to be made out of something that you can uh, ram up in a sand mold and it's not going to damage it. Traditionally, uh, back in the old days, patterns were mostly made out of wood. At least the original pattern was made out of wood. Often they would take the wooden pattern and they would cast an aluminum pattern from the wooden pattern and they would use the aluminum pattern as their production pattern if they were going to be making lots of something because the, the sand will eat wood up over time. You know, if you're making a small number of castings, the, the wood holds up fine. As far as what type of wood, again, traditionally, uh, mahogany was the preferred wood species, mainly because it was easy to work with, easy to carve, easy to put details in. It was also fairly durable and it was extremely stable. It didn't move a lot. Uh, you got a little moisture or something in it. It didn't really move a lot. Uh, cherry was another species that was used a lot. Uh, there really isn't, I don't think, a right or wrong um, answer. I have made uh, patterns out of pine before, particularly if it's just a one-off pattern. It's going to be used one time and, and that's it. Uh, I've used maple, I've, I've used all kinds of different woods. Uh, you do typically want to have something that's a fairly close grained wood, uh, just so you don't get that razor grain effect that makes it difficult to extract the pattern from the, the mold. Uh, but anyway, these are just some examples of modern day stuff. Uh, a lot of my patterns that I've been doing recently, instead of making them out of wood in the traditional fashion, I'll model them in 3D CAD on the computer. And uh, this is one that was just 3D printed. And then we, we painted it to put a nice finish on it. I've uh, had some patterns that were made on a CNC router, even on a CNC machine. You can actually just uh, machine them out of aluminum. Uh, there's a pattern board that's kind of a plastic material that's often used in modern day pattern making. So really, again, there's really no right or wrong answer as long as it's something that will hold up to the, uh, to the molding process. You don't want it to be something real soft. You know, I've seen people try to make them out of styrofoam. Uh, that doesn't hold up real well when you're ramming the pattern. Uh, but anyway, these are just some examples. Simple patterns like this, uh, it's a one piece pattern. You wouldn't have two, two pieces in the mold. Uh, this is a good example. This was a cover that uh, went over a handhole in a steam boiler. 
uh, it had to be machined after it was done. There was actually a bolt that came up through it as well that was uh, cast into the piece. But this was the pattern we used to make that from. And uh, it's, it's just simply set down. It's an oval shaped and it was designed where it would pull from the pattern very easily. Now when you're making a pattern, uh, you got to remember a couple of things. Number one, you want to have what we call draft on anything. You need to think about how is this going to go into the mold and how are they going to pull it from the mold. In this case, they're going to lay this pattern down flat just like it is. They're going to take a, a flask, a wooden box or a metal box, put around it. They're going to ram the sand around it and they're going to flip it over and they're going to pull this up out of the sand. Okay, So you want to have a little bit of an angle. They call it draft on this so that it's bigger at the top and smaller at the bottom. Typically one to two degrees is all you need on draft uh, and that just makes it a little bit easier to pull out. You know if it was the other way if the if the taper was in the opposite direction it would capture the piece into the sand. So think that if it was wider at the bottom than at the top you couldn't pull it out without actually tearing that sand around there. You want to stay away from that at all costs. Always want to have draft on your pattern so that it will pull out. Extremely important. I see a lot of people making patterns and they don't have any draft on the outside. Even if it's just something thin, you still want to have that draft on there because it makes a huge difference when you go to extract that uh, part from the mold. The other thing uh, we need to really always take into consideration is we don't want any sharp corners anywhere on the pattern. You always want to have radiuses on all corners. Uh, all of these are radiused over. In these inside corners we have what's called a fillet. There's a little bit of a radius in there. And that is for, again, a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's easier to extract it from the sand if you have those uh, radiuses on there. But also in the casting process, anytime you have a sharp corner, um, it's going to cool quicker on that corner than it is on the rest of the casting. And as a result of that, that becomes a weak spot in the casting, particularly on these inside corners. If you get that inside corner and it goes down to a sharp corner in there, very often that is that will be a place that that casting will fail. But by simply putting a little bit of a radius in that, uh, in that, that corner, makes all the difference in the world. I, I like to have a minimum of about an eighth inch radius uh, on my fillets. Uh, you know, in some cases you might get away with something a little bit smaller, but I always try to put in the biggest fillet that I can. It just makes, it makes things easier. And um, as far as putting, if you're making a wooden pattern, how do you get that fillet in there? There's lots of different ways. I've seen people just use a, some type of filler material and then take a, a, a template and pull across it. Bondo is a good example of, you know, some type of, of plastic type material. You can mold it in there and then sand it out. This is a uh, piece of leather fillet. This is actually a piece of leather. It's, it's, you would uh, kind of come in here and just glue it in place and you would take one of these uh, fillet tools and you would actually kind of form that fillet in there. These work extremely well and on my wooden patterns I often use this leather fillet. I was fortunate that I picked up a bunch. They also made a wax fillet uh, very similar to this but it was made out of wax instead of uh, leather. Uh, same type thing you would just use that tool and kind of form that fillet in there. This is a fillet tool. Uh, basically it's just some different radius balls on a stick and they're great for uh, even if you're using, if you're kind of like this one right here, I think I did, I think I used Bondo on this one, but I used a fillet tool to kind of go around it and, and form that fillet in there. So anyway, that's a simple pattern. Uh, you know, this one here would have gone, it would have been molded just exactly like that, and then it would have been pulled up out of the sand. That piece would have been down, this piece would have been flat across the top. This one here, this was a pattern I made, uh, one of the first patterns I ever did, and it's a simple pattern. I had it where it would extract out of the sand like this. There's taper uh, on, on both sides. You know, we got the radiuses in there. Uh, if I had this pattern to do over again, I probably would have done it as a split pattern where it was split down the center. It just, you know, anytime you have a deep piece that has to be extracted from the sand, uh, that makes it tougher on the foundry guy, the, the molder. It had been easier from a molding standpoint to have to pull it up out of the sand, not only this distance rather than that distance. 
Uh, so like I said, I probably would have done this one as a split pattern uh, nowadays. This is another pattern that I'm going to call a simple pattern, although it's got a little bit more going on to it than some of the other ones. But it's simple from the standpoint that it doesn't have a parting line in it. It's not a split pattern. Um, this one would have been put on the bench or put on the, in the mold exactly like this and uh, rammed up. Uh, but the thing that's a little bit interesting about this one is you got a gap. If you look on the bottom here, there, there's a little bit of a recess. You know, that's kind of all flat. Uh, and to, for the foundry guy, what he would have done is he would have done this and the sand would have just kind of gone up in there. Uh, when he flipped the part over, he would have kind of taken a tool and took that sand out and uh, the, the piece that went on the top would have just kind of dropped down into there. So again, that's completely an acceptable way of making this particular pattern. Um, and I'm sure that I could send this to Clark and he could cast this right now with no problem, but uh, he would have to cope it out a little bit. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, go watch some of Clark Easterling's videos over at Windy Hill Foundry. I think one of the most important things that you need to understand when you're making a pattern is how the molding process goes. So you can think about how you're making your pattern, how the, the molder's gonna use it. Um, so understanding that part of it really helps and Clark, any project he does, he shows the molding as well as the pouring. So uh, you can kind of see that molding process. Again, on this pattern, you know, like right here, it's thinner at the top than it is at the bottom. This piece is tapered all the way up. You got that draft in there. Same thing on the back back here. You got draft in here. This bottom would have been machined square to the, to the rest of it after the fact. Um, so I'm, I'm not too worried about it being a taper, but uh, because it was going to be machined, but you really got to have that taper for them to extract that out of the mold. What is this part? This was a uh, line shaft hanger. Uh, we actually cast a pair of these and we, they're in use out at the museum right now. This, this hang from the ceiling um, and basically there was a couple of set screws that were machined into this piece here and there was a bearing inside of there that held a uh, line shaft. Uh, this was actually a counter shaft hanger, I believe is what we did to this. And we didn't have one that we needed. Um, we didn't really have, we have an, an original one that was like what we wanted. Uh, we, I found this style and basically just made a pattern. We had a, a pair of these cast and like I said, um, these are actually out at the Georgia Museum of Agriculture in the woodworking shop, the variety works they call it, uh, over, uh, I think it's over the, the 24 inch wood joiner, if I remember right, was what we did this one for. So again, I'd call it a simple pattern, but a little bit more complex because it does require the coping process. Notice the fillets in here. These, uh, I think were leather fillets that I put in this, uh, using this type of stuff here. And, um, after it was done, of course, we paint everything. That's another thing that's real important in pattern making is that your pattern, no matter whether it's wood, metal, plastic, 3D printed, whatever, it has to be super, super smooth. Uh, because if there is any little small imperfection in that surface, uh, when you go to extract it from the sand, that's something that that sand kind of sticks to and it'll tear it out when you pull it out. So um, this, is an, this pattern was probably used 15 years ago. It's been sitting in my, in a, on a shelf out in the shop. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not as smooth as it was when it was new, but you kind of get the idea. It needs to be extremely smooth. Um, need to be, any, any surface that's gonna be pulled from that sand, need to have that draft to it so it'll come right out. Um, and that's just absolutely critical. 3D printed patterns. I do a lot of 3D printed patterns now. Uh, when they come off the 3D printer, they're not smooth enough. They are nowhere close to being smooth enough to be used as a pattern. You've got to do a lot of work to that 3D printed pattern. Usually I'm going to uh, spray it with primer, several layers of primer, do some sanding in between. Some cases I even have to put some, you know, Bondo or body filler or some type of plastic filler in there and smooth it out because uh, most 3D printers are not going to produce a very or a super smooth surface like you need uh, to extract it from the mold. This one was made out of wood. I think if I remember right, I actually made this one out of poplar. We were only making two patterns, so I wasn't too worried about uh, it being, you know, something that was gonna last for a really long time. 
Another concept we need to kind of wrap our minds around when you're doing pattern making is, is you have to take into consideration shrink. This is a real important factor. And uh, what you need to understand is that when you pour that metal and it's in a molten state, you pour, this is kind of a cross section of a mold. Uh, it has a core in this case, so that's going to kind of be a hollow spot inside. I'll be a sand core. This is the sand on the outside. Uh, this is where the pattern was, and they pulled that out. That was all hollow. They poured the solid metal in there. As it cools, it's going to shrink. Uh, that's just part of it. it. Anytime you heat something up, it expands. When you cool it, it contracts. And you're going from a molten metal to a solid metal, and in that process, it's going to shrink. Now, the shrink factors are going to be different depending on the different kinds of materials. And uh, I got a little chart. This is a cheat sheet that I made a long time ago on my computer based on some stuff out of some foundry books I have. So in most cases, you know, cast iron is going to probably be probably what I do most. Uh, brass probably second, aluminum third. Uh, cast iron, on a percentage basis, it's about uh, 0.8 to 1% shrink. And uh, the way the pattern makers used to do, do this is they had a... Uh, uh, inches per foot. Generally speaking, I'm going to go with a shrink factor of one eighth inch per foot for cast iron, which is about 1%. Now, in the old days when they were making wooden patterns, what the foundry guys had is they had these back here. These are called shrink rules. So this is just like a regular ruler. And I have a whole set of these in different with different shrink factors in them. Uh, but if you look, I got them basically all lined up on one end straight, but each one of them is a little bit longer, or in this case, shorter than the other ones. So these shrink rules are actually, they take into account that shrinkage that will happen. And this is what they would use to make it. They would make it like they were making it from an, a one inch, you know, one in, a true one inch, but this has the shrink factor built into it. So uh, let's see, for cast iron, I said we do about an eighth of an inch per foot. Look right here, it says shrink one eighth inch per foot. So that is the shrink rule you would use with a, for cast iron. This is a real 12 inch ruler next to it. And if you look, this shrink rule is, is exactly one eighth of an inch longer per foot. So for every inch in here, it's scaled out. So you could use this and if, you, if you were making a part, you know, if you wanted the, the finished part to be six inches long, you could use this rule, measure six inches, this actually going to be a little bit oversized. This has the shrink factor built into it. I've got a whole set of shrink rules here with different shrink factors uh, for different materials. Now, in the computer, it's really easy to do this if you're just drawing it up and going to 3D print or uh, use a CNC system. Just draw it up at regular size, and then at the very end, um, you just scale your part up by whatever factor. So again, for cast iron, I usually use 1%. If I'm using doing brass, it's 1.5%. Aluminum, I usually use about 1.25%, uh, 1.3%, something like that. So uh, and you can, in many cases, talk to your foundry, and they can tell you the exact shrink for the exact, uh, for the particular material that they're using. And remember, different alloys of aluminum, different uh, cast iron that has different uh, ratios of stuff in there. It's not all going to be the same. That's why there's a range on each one of these. Uh, but very important if you want your casting to be right. I, I've seen more than one person. Well, I made my pattern exactly the size. I go have it cast and it's too small when they get through. Uh, it's because it's going to shrink. So up next, we're kind of moving up in the complexity of things, and I'm going to talk about split patterns. And most patterns that I make are going to be split patterns, uh, where you're going to have in the mold, part of it's going to be in the bottom half of the mold, and part of it's going to be in the top half of the mold. Let's look at this one here, because this is fairly simple. This is actually a cast iron uh, gear blank for a gear that I'm, I'm going to be making. Uh, I, in fact, I just got the casting back. I got to machine this thing out. So uh, in, in this case, if you look, it's a two-piece pattern. It pulls apart. Um, half of it is in, well, not really exactly half. We took a parting. The parting line is, in this case, if you look, there's kind of a uh, recess on both sides, but the recess is deeper on one side of the other. I made my parting line so that it was basically halfway through that center uh, section there. So that's the reason one part is a little bit thicker than the other. Uh, but the web in here is the same thickness on both of them, if that makes sense. So 
in doing this, you mold up the bottom part, then you put the top part on, you mold up the top part, you separate the two halves in the sand, and then you extract the, the pattern out of both sides, and that leaves the void in the mold uh, that will be used to fill up with cast iron. And again, uh, if you go look at Clark Easterling's video, he actually has a video where he molds this uh, pattern. I think he's got this one. I know he's got this other one back here, uh, but he did a video on this and, and this shows how he molded this up. But this is a simple split pattern. Um, notice I've got a pin. In this case, it was round, so there's just one pin hole where it, it indexes the two halves together so that they come out right. This one, again, was 3D printed. I uh, did a lot of sanding and filling and whatever to get it nice and smooth. And then uh, Clark actually put some graphite on it at the foundry to kind of help it make it a little bit slicker so that it would extract from that mold a little bit easier. Um, this other one here, this was a, a, a pulley uh, that I needed to make. And again, this, this, the parting line was halfway through the thickness of the web. I uh, got the little indexing pins in here. There's two of them in this case because, you know, we, we don't want it to, we want it to line up right with those spokes. So again, two halves, these you would cast or you would mold the two halves separately. And then uh, one part of it be in the, in the top part of the mold and part of it be in the bottom part of the mold. And uh, anyway, just a very basic split pattern here. These, uh, these were actually done on a CNC router. So uh, I drew them up in the computer, sent the files to a friend of mine who had a CNC router, and these were actually made out of wood, uh, but they used a CNC router to, to carve them out. They theoretically could have been 3D printed, but uh, got, it was actually a lot smoother and you got a more, the, it's more dense material out of the, the wood than the, the plastic. I really like that CNC routing option and uh, came out really nice and the, the finishing time, the amount of time it took me to get that pattern uh, finished up was actually much faster than the 3D printed one uh, because I didn't have to do as much finish work to it. It was a lot smoother coming out of the, the 3D router than off of the, uh, off of the printer. Notice again, you know, we got the fillets in here, we got radiuses in all of our corners. Um, there's, there's draft, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's draft on either side, on the inside and outside. So this brings up another point that I want to kind of introduce here too, that you need to also take into consideration when you're making your patterns. This part's going to be machined. Um, uh, part of it will be, you know, a rough casting part of, part of this, we're going to have to cut metal off of it. So when, when I machine this, we will face both sides of this boss get that to an exact thickness. Uh, it's gonna be bored out. There's gonna be a hole that goes through here for a shaft, there'll be a keyway cut in there. And then uh, this surface will be both faced on, the, on both sides so that it's the proper uh, width there. And then it'll, this top part will be machined perfectly round. It's actually will have a crown, so we'll have a little bit of a, of a draft on either side. It'll be thinner on the outsides than in, in the middle. Uh, which is typical on a flat belt pulley. Now, you need to add material to your pattern anywhere that you're going to machine it off. Now, the general rule of thumb is for any machine surface, you need to add about an eighth of an inch of material to the casting so that you have material to actually cut off. As the pattern gets bigger and bigger, the casting gets bigger and bigger, I usually add a little bit more material just because there's you know, imperfections in the casting. You want to, be, to clean up nice, whatever. But typically, on most stuff, I'm going to add at least an eighth of an inch to those uh, to those thicknesses or those surfaces that are going to be machined. So this, you know, hub here is out about an eighth of an inch. I will machine it off. Same thing on the outside. The thickness of this casting is about an eighth of an inch thicker than uh, what the finished product's going to be because it needs to have some room on there to machine. So again, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, you don't want to not have, when, if you, if you got to have a machine surface, you got to have metal to take off. So add that metal to your pattern. So moving up in the complexity of these patterns, uh, this next one here, we've got, this is the pattern. This is what's called a core box. And I painted these where you can kind of see what's going on. 
you have the black is basically what the finished casting will look like. This was actually a nozzle uh, that goes on the, up in the front end of a steam locomotive that the exhaust steam shoots up the stack. So uh, it goes, it's basically a restrictor. It, can, it goes from a larger diameter down to a smaller diameter. There's a taper on the inside of this to kind of make it smaller as it goes in there. So it's a ring. Uh, it was hollow on the inside. Instead of casting this solid and then having all that metal to move out uh, or remove out as later on, uh, we just cast this as a ring with that inside being hollow. And the way we did that is we did a core. So again, this is a split pattern. It separates in half. There's two halves. You would mold these up in the sand just like you would anything else. But uh, you can see it right here, uh, how I have it painted. This is how the inside of this is. This is a cross section. You can see the black and you can see the yellow is actually the area that's hollow. The way we make that hollow was we put a core in there. This is a core box. The core box matches uh, what we call these little areas out here. This is the core prints. This is what the core sets down into. And um, this is, you would ram sand up inside of this. They would use a binder in there. Water glass was often used. You expose it to carbon dioxide and it turns real hard um, and makes it where you can actually pick it up and handle it. So after this was molded, um, you've got the, the core prints and you have the core. In this case, this, this core, we, it was done in two halves. It's symmetrical in this case. So one one core print was able to do both sides and they would just, they would do the two halves, they would glue the, the core together. It would become a, you know, a round piece that has that constriction in it. And then they would literally just drop that core into the mold. And so when you poured it, you had a sand uh, core going through there. And of course the sand, anything the sand there's nothing there. Any place there's a hollow space, that's going to fill up in that mold. So anyway, this is a, um, a, a an example of a cord pattern. It's a split pattern with a core. And again, we have the pattern, has the core prints built into the pattern, and we also had to make a core box. Now this particular one here, this was 3D printed. Uh, I drew it all up in the computer. Actually, I think someone else drew this one up for me. This was before I learned how to do it myself. But um, uh, we basically just 3D printed all the, all the pieces here, sent this off to the foundry, and, uh, and it was cast. So I got another example of a cord pattern here. This, is a, this was a pulley. Uh, if you guys have been watching my channel for a long time, back when I first started doing videos, I was restoring a, uh, the J.A. Vance planer matcher out at the museum. It was a woodworking machine made back in the 1800s that surfaced uh, all four sides of a piece of lumber. Uh, you could do like tongue and groove uh, flooring on it or something like that. This was uh, one of the, the pulleys that actually had a radius on it like this. This is a, uh, where a belt made a half twist. Uh, and this was what drove the side heads. And if uh, again, going back in time, I actually uh, had these cast. I did the, some of the machining on them. I couldn't do the radius myself. I sent these out to Keith Finner. And he had a video where he actually used his tracing attachment on his lathe uh, to make uh, actually the machine this particular surface here but I want to show you this pattern this was one this one was made out of wood I actually made this one on the wood lathe and, I, and I've got a video uh, one of my very first videos I ever made as a matter of fact uh, not really quite up to the same standard uh, that more some of my videos that I have now are but it's still on the site on making this pattern so this is a split pattern made out of wood let me see if I can separate it it's getting kind of old and been around a while but uh kind of rough on the inside i actually uh did i went to a lot of a lot of work on this to make it in the traditional way and i'm not going to go into a lot of that it's kind of rough on the inside but uh, anyway you can see where i had the pins to um kind of put it together this one's not painted but here's the core box for it and if you look the the yellow matches the core prints in this case i painted the inside red so the inside would kind of be what was in here, let me get a Sharpie pen, and uh, it kind of went like this right here. So all that would have been hollow on the inside of the casting by when you put that core in there. So you would drop the core down into the core prints, 
And when you cast it, it left it where you had a hollow through here. This was later bored to the final size to fit up onto a uh, shaft. Uh, there was a little bit of a recess down the bottom of this where it was just didn't really need the weight and stuff in there. So that was made a little bit oversized. Uh, but anyway, this was another example of a split pattern with a core and the core box that was used to make it. And uh, again, you can go look at older videos and uh, actually see that one being machined and see the final product. So I thought I'd show this pattern. This is not one that I built. This was actually made by a pattern shop. I have no idea what this part was for, but I found this at some point in time. I actually was in a pattern shop that was uh, going out of business. They were selling a bunch of tools and equipment and stuff in there. And I found this pattern that was in there and I actually bought it. They didn't charge me that much for it just to have as an example because I thought it was pretty cool. But this is a this is a commercial group pattern. It says cylinder on there. I have no idea what this went to, but it's really quite interesting. Now, this was a it was a wooden pattern, but this was actually a production pattern. It was one that was being used to make lots of parts off of. And uh, they used a process where they actually made the put the patterns. They mounted it on a board and uh, you basically have both halves of the pattern on either half of the board. If I flip this over, uh, there's the other, other side of the pattern on the other side. This was uh, often used in a, in a mold making machine. They had the, the two flasks or the, the, the boxes that held the sand. Uh, they indexed into, uh, they probably had a, a metal piece on here that they actually indexed into so that it would keep them lined up. They had both halves on there. They would fill one half the sand up, ram it, flip it over, do the other half, and then they would pull the board and the pattern would all come out together on both halves. And when they put them back together, they would match up perfectly, if that makes sense. Uh, this was, a, again, often used when they're doing more production work and they were using a machine to help in the molding process. But notice here, uh, I, I will say that when I make patterns, often, paint them, particularly if it's a cord pattern where the, the casting part is painted black and uh, the cores and core prints are painted yellow. In this case, they just left them a natural color. That was a common practice by a lot of foundries. Uh, over in, in Europe, I think they had a different color pattern than they did here in the U.S. And some patterns or some foundries had their own color patterns on how you uh, would would indicate things, but it helped the, the 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 molder understand what was going on because he knew these were core prints. This was the actual casting in this case. Uh, this was the pattern, and then I also was lucky enough to find the core boxes uh, for this. So let me show you the core boxes. They're they're quite interesting as well. So in this case, the core box was not symmetrical. One side was different than the other, so you had to have two core boxes. But again, it was done in halves. They would fill this up with sand. They would ram it in there. They would have the, the water glass in it. They would gas this with CO2. It would turn this into a really hard um, sand piece that they could just pick up and then set down in those core prints. Uh, but notice a couple of things here. Number one, you see these little pieces that go down through there? And up over, I think you can still see that in the back, back here, maybe. This is the pattern back here in the back. These were the core prints. So in this case, I think these indentions down here actually came through the bottom. This would have been hollow. It would have been a hole that went all the way through the casting um, and came out on the other side. You would have had core prints there. So everywhere you see this, there was a hole. There was a hole that went right through the center of this. You can see the core prints that actually went into the middle. Uh, notice in here that it was round. So in the inside of this pattern, they had the, the pieces that went down and it was actually had a connected, they were connected. So it was hollow all the way around. These came in from the outsides. So basically everything that's in this, in the core would be a hollow place in the pattern. It's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around, but that's exactly what was going on. Um, in the middle, it was all solid. Notice here. Uh, they had this piece here was yellow and it had the stripes in there. There was actually another core that fit, that, that fit down into that piece. Um, and I have, I didn't, don't have that piece, but there was probably, I'm guessing there was probably, you know, a, a passage that went through there. And uh, the only way to really do that was to have yet another core 
that went into the core. You have multiple cores in this case. Uh, when you get into this kind of castings, things really get complicated, uh, but it was amazing what they could do back in the day. Think of, a, of, a, of an engine, uh, like in a, goes in a car. Uh, there's all types of hollow places inside of that where, where the water went, where oil flowed, the pistons where they went up and down, where the crankshaft turned. All of that would have been cored out in the actual casting. Uh, and then, so you would have had the, the actual pattern, then you would have had all these cores that went in there. Some of these, some of these castings would have had 15, 20 different cores that fit down inside of them to get those hollow places inside the castings. They can be extremely, extremely complicated. Uh, all this is made out of mahogany. I thought that's kind of neat. You can see the mahogany wood here. Um, but again, there is a pattern in the core box. I don't have the second core box, but you can kind of see what it would look like. And uh, I, again, I have no idea what this part was for, but I just thought it was really interesting and uh, picked it up and have kept it all these years. And now I'm sharing it with you guys. Guys, I think I have covered the basics. And when I say basics, I'm talking about the bare minimum basics for pattern making. Number one, take into account shrink. Number two, make sure your pattern has draft to it. Number three, make sure you have uh, radiuses, fillets in all the corners and radius over edges, no sharp corners anywhere in there. Um, four, make sure your pattern is very, very smooth. It's been sanded out, smooth as a baby's behind. You cannot have anything for sand to grip to for that when you pull those, those patterns apart. If you take those, those basic things into consideration, chances are you can make a, a, an acceptable pattern that can be used in the foundry uh, to cast a part for yourself. Uh, I would highly encourage you to uh, do a little more research on pattern making if you're going to do it. There's lots and lots of books. I've got in my collection of books, multiple books. When I was first learning how to pattern making, I was reading through these old textbooks. There's some books that you can go uh, and they're, they're online. If you go search Google Books, there's bunches of pattern making books from back in the late 1800s, early 1900s that are out of copyright. They're available online. You can go look at them. And, you know, while we often use more modern techniques, the basics are still the same. They're still the same. So you can really kind of look at a lot of the illustrations in the books to kind of get a better idea of what's going on rather than just looking at me or listening to me explain it. Uh, the other thing, again, go watch some molding videos. Go watch some guys who have foundry channels that are doing molding so you understand the molding process. One of the key things that any pattern maker had to do, really before they learned the art of pattern making, they had to learn the art of molding, at least the basics of it. Molders and pattern making were, makers were different trades back in the day, but a pattern maker had to understand how things were molded so that he knew how to make the patterns right. So go watch some videos. Windy Hill Foundry has them. There's other channels out there that have uh, videos in there on showing how they're molding stuff in the sand. You need to understand it. And uh, the final piece of advice that I would give you is uh, before you just send the pattern to whatever foundry you're using to, again, if you're using Windy Hill, uh, talk with the foundry guy about it ahead of time. Uh, ask them, you know, show them what you're trying to do. Ask them how, how they want you to make that pattern uh, to make it easier on them. In many cases, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as the old saying goes. There's more than one way to make a pattern, but from the molding standpoint, there's probably an easier pattern to actually make a mold from and a more difficult pattern. So, you know, talk with your foundry guy, you know, figure out how it's going to make their life easier. And, uh, you know, I would even share with them, you know, some pictures, a, a sketch of the pattern you're getting ready to make and just let them look at it. I mean, I still do that myself. Uh, I said, well, before I go make a pattern, I'll, I'll draw it up. Now I'm doing most of it in the computer. I'll draw it up. I'll say, hey, Clark, take a look at this. Uh, does this look acceptable to you? Uh, well, I would do this different. Okay, I may go back and change it now. Uh, it just makes things easier on them. So just some basic things to consider. And uh, hopefully you can make some patterns that will be acceptable and uh, not cause your foundry man to pull his hair out and have to charge you lots of extra money for all the time that takes them to either turn your pattern into something useful or to be out there piddling around um, 
failure after failure because the pattern just wasn't done right to begin with. Do it right the first time, makes life a lot easier. Guys, I um, hope that is helpful to you. I know there's a lot of talking in this video, not a lot of doing, uh, but again, you just need to kind of get your mind wrapped around the art of pattern making. Pattern making wasn't, it was a, a trade all in, its, in itself back in the day. Uh, very skilled woodworker, metal workers did pattern making. Uh, and uh, it's still done today, but of course most things are computerized in this day and age. Guys, that is going to be a wrap. As always, uh, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And uh, those thumbs up and comments are appreciated. And with that, we'll catch you on the next video.